heart that God has drawn us together because uh, this is important to the kingdom. Um, I thought today, before I start with prayer, I thought everybody's talking about rescue and oh, I got a rescue dog, I got a rescue cat, I rescued this, I that, and it's all the rage to get a rescue pet. But to rescue a human, boy, that gets personal. You know, we put ourselves out there. And trusting God, well, we all trust God, except for the parts that we want to, oh, this is my life, I don't know, I feel itchy, I don't feel comfortable. Well, uh, we don't need God if we feel comfortable doing the things that we do. It's that uncomfortable time that he pulls us in to find out if we believe what he said. And the greatest thing a Christian can experience is going out, trusting God, allowing Him to lead you, put words in your mouth, and watch somebody step over that line and accept Christ. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. We didn't save them. That's not our responsibility to save them. Our responsibility is to tell them the truth, in love, in love. Billy Graham said, there's not one person that you can scare or threaten into heaven. But we can draw them in to his kingdom by his love. So this is what it's all about. I I would love to see uh, this Greenfield town and surrounding area just uh, be won over by God. But it takes us to do this. You know, and it's a two-part thing. One is telling them the good news, the gospel, sharing the gospel. Part two, and it's the most important thing. It says, go out and make disciples. What, What is a disciple? It's a learner. It's just a learner, someone that learns. Christ had 12 of them. And they didn't know anything when they first met him. They didn't know anything. You know, the first two disciples ran after him. They were with John the Baptist. They saw Jesus. John the Baptist pointed him out and said, there he is. They ran up to him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, where, uh, uh. And they were nervous. They didn't didn't know. And they said, where do you live? And it would have been so easy for him to say, well, I live over 12th and Vine. But he said, follow me. Discipling is very important. You can take a plant, put it in the ground, push the dirt around it, walk away, and I will guarantee you that plant will die. Because it needs you to water it, to fertilize it, to go over every once in a while and say, how you doing? And, and that's, that's what discipling is. You bring people in. Stretch that little bitty faith they had. Stretch it and stretch it and stretch it until they get to see God work in their lives. That's the most important thing. So let's uh, prayer. I, I would love to stay here, but I ha- have a job. It's an awesome job. I work for my son. And uh, it's almost a guarantee that I won't get fired. <laughs> so let's pray. So, Father, thank you so much for this gathering today of the people that are hungry for you. We pray you knit our hearts together and give us one heartbeat in you as we seek to do your will on earth. Father, you sent your only son to seek and to save the lost. He died for our sins. And we thank you and praise you for that. We come to you this morning 
with humility and love to ask you to pour your spirit out on us. Cause us to burn with the fire of your love, Father. Give us this town for your kingdom's sake. Father, fill us up so much with your love that it overflows to other. Father, in the Psalms you said you would give us the heathen for our inheritance. And that is what we ask you for. Oh, Father, give us your eyes and your ears and your heart for the lost. Father, we ask you to lead us. There are people hurting and broken. Father, if you lead us to them, we will love them with your love. We want to do your will, Father. Go before us and pray. prepare the hearts to receive from you. Father, we want to see a great awakening in this town. We want to see fathers' hearts turn toward their children and children's hearts turn toward their fathers. Marriages healed. We want to see broken families restored. We know you can do this. And we thank you that we know you hear our prayers. And we give you this prayer this morning. In your son's precious name, amen. All right, Doc, thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Lori, his wife, which is right here, this is Lori Barnes, sitting here with the orange vest on. She shared with me that you changed the name of your Bible study <laughs> to Bodybuilders. <laughs> yes. Yes, and did that before we started announcing this. She was the one, 40, almost 45 years ago, uh, she was a waitress at Bob Evans, and I was working on a dairy farm, and my combine caught on fire, and that was before cell phones. And so I ran up to Bob Evans, and I went in there so we could call the fire department, and I looked, and she was standing on the other side of that counter, and I forgot what I was there for. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, had, I was just a natural man with natural thoughts, and you know what natural men with natural thoughts think. Yeah. And I asked her to go out, and she said, yes, I will go out with you, but it's got to be at 6 o'clock in the morning at some little coffee shop. <coughs> and a uh, very smart woman. And so we went there, and she shared the gospel with, to me. And she said, if you're here for what I'm thinking you're here for, you might as well get on up and go on home. Because I'm a, a godly woman <laughs> and nothing's going to happen until I'm married. And it was like God put this bell jar over her. I could hear her, but I couldn't touch her. And everything she said, it was like magnified. And so that's how our relationship started. I was probably in a spiritual coma after I accepted Christ for maybe 10 years. But uh, God is good. She is long-suffering. And <laughs> now all the prayers that she prayed years and years and years before I started pastoring has come true. And God is so good. So I just wanted to share that with you. I, I'm a part of our little church in Greenfield is a part of a big uh, international church. It's non-denomination. We, we have uh, 850 churches all over the world. And uh, there's a college and a, all that there, a kindergarten through uh, Bible college. So we go there the third week in June, and people from all over the world come, and we just party like it's, there's not going to be tomorrow. And I love it. And so, uh, anyway, it's uh, my honor to be here and to be a part of this. Trust God. Deny yourself. Believe what he says. And it's okay to be nervous, see? Because he's right there with us. Right there with us. Amen? Amen. So, Lori, behind every great man is a greater woman. Thank you for witnessing to him that day rather than encouraging his yeah. carnal thoughts. Okay.
So, for those of you who don't know, my name is Rich Bailey, and I'm pastor here at Curry's Chapel Church. I started here almost a year ago. I started on Mother's Day of last year. And you're going to hear throughout individual testimonies about how we came to become a believer in Christ. For me, it started when I was about 21. It was 21 before I ever had my first date. And around 22, I met two young ladies who were in Washington, D.C. for the American Studies Program. One lived locally. Her father was one of the pastors to the U.S. Congress at that time. And the other was from Colorado, but attending church, not church, attending college in Taylor University in Upland, Indiana. Well, just like Don mentioned, you know, the carnal mind, I started dating these two at the same time. Yeah, it gets worse than that. I actually uh, canceled a date on one of them to go out with the other. <laughs> but here's what happened for me. Okay? I found something about their person, about their life, that made me interested in why they had a joy that I didn't have. Because frankly, I had been searching for a while. I uh, went to the Church of Scientology and other things that uh, aren't so uh, helpful, <laughs> shall we say. But uh, eventually, uh, I learned what their joy and their peace was about. And so on July 4th of 1976, while sitting in the, uh, uh, oh, what's the name? A Baptist church in outside of Washington, D.C., preacher Dick Halverson, who was then at that time uh, chaplain to the United States Senate and Congress, was speaking on what? I have no idea. <laughs> but what happened for me is that I had a vision that day. And what I saw in that vision was Jesus Christ being put on trial, not for the sins of the world, but for me personally, all of my sins. And it was shortly after that that uh, Sherry, who was with me that day, one of the two girls I mentioned earlier, led me into salvation prayer. So that's how I came to be here. So, anyway, so look around you. There's a lot of folks here. No. But you know what? The important people are here. Amen. And the attendance here actually points towards what uh, my keynote message is this morning. And that is our society tells us not to look up, right? So don't look up. That's what society is telling us. Have any of you heard about or seen the movie Don't Look Up? One of the stars in in that movie is Jennifer Lawrence, and she plays the part of a graduate uh, candidate for astronomy. And she discovers this huge, huge, huge comet coming to the, towards the Earth. She shares that with her professor. He shares it with NASA. NASA brings him in to see the President of the United States. And they explain to the president that this is an extinction level event and we're all going to die. She is more interested in her Facebook ratings than anything else. So the movie progresses, the word gets out, and towards the end, the president decides that telling people they're going to die isn't a good thing. So when the comet comes into view, that you can see it with the naked eye, the scientist and the candidate start telling everybody, just look up, it's right there. But our government, the United States government, is saying, oh, don't look up, don't look up. Well, isn't that the way it is here with our society? Our society, the people around us, our government, are telling people, don't look up. But the Great Commission tells us to, we have to do what? Go on to all the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Well, you can see there's not a lot of interest in the churches today in evangelism. 
And that's why we're here. We're going to create a core group here that will go out and evangelize. Okay? And as we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to help people find a church that best fits their need. Okay? I'm not interested in them coming here to Curry's Chapel. If they want to, great. But if somebody has a need that we can't fill, you know, so Josh, where do you go to church? Brandywine. Okay, Brandywine. Excellent. Brandywine has a recovery program. Okay? So if we found somebody who has an addiction or whatever, we can send them to Brandywine because they have that program. Okay? We don't have that here at this church. We're too small. Okay? So the goal would be to win people for Christ or those who claim to be Christians, which is 90% of Greenfield's community, of which only 20% are ever in church on a given Sunday. Okay? Our goal is to get their butts in a pew. Okay? Because what's the church for, after all? The church is a hospital for sinners. Right? We're all sinners. We all need a hospital. And it doesn't matter if it's me or Marilyn or Don or Theo or Steve or anybody, a pastor, or anybody here like Eugene or Josh or Joe or whomever. We all need this hospital. Okay? In Isaiah chapter 42, verses 26 to 28, it says, Look up to the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? That's what we're here for, to spread that kind of a message, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? Who can quote with me John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he said his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. Right? So that's what we have to do. You might ask, why are we here today? We're here today because a couple of months ago, God laid on my heart a very strong feeling for the lost and for the folks that aren't going to church that claim to be Christians. He told me that this church and the people attending today will be influential in starting a re revival here in Hancock County. Amen? Thank you, Josh. I like that. Talk back to me. <laughs> you know, if you were at uh, Alex's church, that's going to happen all the time. Alex has got a great ministry. I'll tell you more about that later. Okay? So, why is there an urgency today? If you look around you, okay, there are wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, all kinds of things are going on. More and more people are hating one another. Just look in our country. The Republicans and Democrats can't talk to each other without screaming at each other or calling them a racist, right? That's not what God intended. But he did predict it in the Bible, didn't he? So my belief is that sometime in the next 20 years, that we will have the rapture occur and the tribulation will begin. Why do you ask do I say that? In May of 19... <coughs> not, not, sorry. 19... I forget what day. 1946. That's it. May of 1946. Do you know what the United Nations did that day? I'm sorry? That's right. Lorraine got it right. The state of Israel was brought back as a country. 48. 48, yes, after World War II. Okay? In Isaiah, it tells us that this nation shall not pass before the Lord comes. This generation, that's correct. Okay? It tells us that when Israel becomes a nation once again in a single day, and that happened in May of 1948, that generation born at that time will not perish before the second coming arrives. So if we assume an 80 to 120 year lifespan, 
That's somewhere in the next 25 to 30 years. Why does that mean? You know, as you go out later today and you go eat lunch or you go shopping or you're driving by, you know that the majority of the people you're going to pass are not going to be in heaven. And why is that? Because they're not saved. They haven't done what is necessary to become saved. That doesn't mean they have to be in church, although that's certainly preferable, because after all, we're called to be <laughs> disciples. We're called to <coughs> grow and learn. But just accepting Christ is only the first step. Okay? We're not here because of works. We're here because of the love of Jesus Christ and Him alone. So, with what's going on in the world, it's our duty, each and every one of us, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those we come in contact with. Okay? Now, everybody so far that's been up here and spoken told you what? God will prompt you to go talk to Eugene, or to Jim, or to Dave, if they're not saved. Why does he do that? Because he knows you have a message that will touch their heart and bring them into the kingdom. Now what happens if you don't do that? Somebody else might do it. Okay? Or nobody else does it, and where do they go? They go to hell. So, here's a quote for you. This is by uh, Reverend Spurgeon. You've probably heard of him somewhere along the line. He says, if sinners are damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exhortations, and let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. That's probably the strongest statement I've ever heard in my life about why we are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the people around us. They all need to hear the word and become believers in order to enter that kingdom. And if we don't share that word, they might never be there. Now, as witnesses, evangelists, whatever you want to call yourself. Your job is to give that message. Your job that day may be to plant a seed. Your job that day may be to water the seed that got planted by someone else. Or your job might be to reap the harvest. And if you don't listen to God and follow his leading, you haven't done your part. Amen? Amen? All right. So, next up are introductions. So, you've already met Don Pfaff back there. He was our worship leader. You've already met me. I'm the pastor here. We also have Steve Ellis with us. Steve, if you'd stand up and wave or whatever. Steve is the former pastor of this church. I took over from him in May of last year. And here's an interesting story about how I came here, and then we'll go to the other introductions. Becky, who is sitting over there in that doorway, and she's waving her hand, okay? In summer, what, this is what, 13, no, this 23, 20, in the summer of 2020, she was walking around the neighborhood where I live, and I happened to be outside, and she saw me, and we struck up a conversation, and she invited me to come here to church. Well, I politely said, well, I'll probably come. Six months later, I come to this church. And at the end of the service, I share with Pastor Steve over there that this church was very similar to a church that I had pastored some 35 years earlier. Steve looked me straight in the eye and said, would you like to come out of retirement? <laughs> My response was, 
well, if the Lord opens the door, it's my duty to walk through it, and if he wants to kick me out, he can do that. Well, long story short, I became pastor of this church in May of last year, on Mother's Day. Okay? So, so Steve will be speaking here shortly. He's going to share about the mandates and go through that. Theo Griffin, powerful man of God. I love his smile, and he always has something good to say. And Theo is pastor, lead pastor at Brown's Chapel Wesleyan Church. That's hard for me to get all those words. That's why he's hit in the cadence. So Theo is going to be speaking. And then our main speaker for today is Alex Wortham. Alex is a blessed man of God. The first time I met with him was to help bring this together. And I had found out from a previous pastor's meeting that Alex was writing his dissertation on evangelism. And I was told by the person who told me that, Alex is excited by what you're doing. So I went up to Alex and asked him if he'd be interested. We got together for dinner one evening over at Applebee's, and we got to talking, and he was interested in doing this, and I was interested in having him do it, but he shared some things with me. That next Sunday, I'd already written my sermon, and this was what, a Thursday, wasn't it? You know what I ended up preaching on that following Sunday? Not what I had planned. Because his words to me, God impressed upon me, that's what you need to speak on. I went to Alex's uh, dedication for his church, which was what, three Sundays ago? Okay. Had a great congregation there. Several of the churches were represented, helping to uh, support that day. And his bishop for this area, and I forget that bishop's name. What was his name? Calvin Worthen. That's right. Calvin Worthen. I knew the last name. Okay? Your uncle. Okay? And he's out of Mississippi, right? He didn't speak that way. He had a powerful message. And that message, again, changed what I preached about that following Sunday. So, great things going on. They're a new church. They just uh, purchased uh, the what used to be called the Wedding Chapel at 226 West North Street. They meet at 1 o'clock on Sundays for worship. I'd encourage all of you at some time, go and visit that church, and you will have a powerful word come towards you. Then uh, we have, well, that's it. That's everything. All right? So, without further ado... Let's move on to the foundational mandates, and Steve will talk to us about that. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I just got over pneumonia and I'm a little weak yet. I don't have it, but I, uh, I don't have as much oomph as I used to. So, But uh, did you know that God loves you? He does. I'm here to tell you, if nobody's ever told you, God loves you, each and every one of you. It's important to hear that. I'm Steve Ellis, and uh, I'm a retired pastor, whatever that retired means. I haven't quite figured that part of it out yet. And uh, I want to I want to thank you for letting me come and speak today. Uh, it's a privilege, and uh, this is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but I have to start out by asking you kind of a tough question. Who in your church, whatever church you go to, who in that church is responsible for evangelism? Oh, some of you looked at your pastor. Some of you looked at the guy next to you. That's not it. That's not the right answer, guys. I'm sorry. Okay? Evangelism means telling other people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That is evangelism. And if you haven't told them, how are they going to know? Sooner or later, somebody's got to say it. Now, so don't look at your pastor to do that, because he can't be every place you are. You can't be every place he is, okay? 
It's not the pastor's job. Now, a lot of people don't buy that, but it's the truth. You know, here's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. A pastor is to pray for, care for, and head his flock in spiritual matters. Nowhere in there does it say the pastor is responsible for making out the budget. Okay, or taking care of financial matters. He's not to develop new programs. He's not to take care of the music. Guys like Don do that, right? He's not to lead the youth program. And he's not the head of the evangelism committee. All right? Being an evangelist is a blessing. If God tells you to go talk to somebody and you do it, that's a blessing. There's a blessing that comes with that. If you don't do it, you're going to miss that blessing, guys. And so was that person. So if the pastor isn't supposed to be the one doing that, who is? So maybe, maybe we should ask God what he wants, who he wants to spread this word. Maybe we better ask him directly and see what Jesus tells us. Where do you think we can find out what God wants us to do? I know everybody is slow to pick this whole book up. Some of you might have it on your computer. It's not quite as heavy. But that's where you go. This is the word of God for us, for each and every one of us. It's called the Bible, right? Maybe we should go there. So I want to take a look at, at, at what God tells us we as individuals are supposed to be doing. Not what the preacher's doing, what we're supposed to be doing. Okay? Now, I've got to tell you, some of this might be a little bit problem for some people. And I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm just going to lay it out, and you take it for what it's worth. You know, the, I get the demographics for this county. And 95% of the people, between 90 and 95, depends which report you get, says that the people of Hancock County claim to be Christian. Well, where are they? Okay? If every church in our county had three services on Sunday morning and they were packed full, we'd still have half the county that wasn't in church. Does that tell you anything? Wow. That's a little scary. Half our citizens or more believe that the church, that is the body of Christ, because that's who we are. The church is the body of Christ. Believe it's not necessary. They want the head, but they don't want the body. What happens when you cut the head off the body? It dies. Both, right? The head is Jesus Christ. The body is you. Us, collectively. Okay? Now show me in the Bible where it says you don't have to go to church. Anybody know such a passage? Because I don't. I couldn't find it. I even thought I'd go look. It's not in there, guys. It doesn't say that. Jesus said, on this rock, now by the way, this is from Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, on this rock, I will found my church. Not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. You get that? My church, and nothing can stand against it. Jesus' church, not my church, not your church. It's his church. Every building you look at was dedicated to him and belongs to him. It's his. So what's that say about those who don't believe in the body of Christ? His church. What's that say to you about them? Well, first of all, it says they don't have the power to stand against hell. That's what he just said. Even the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Okay? That means if you're outside the church, what are you going to prevail against? You've got to do it all on your own, all on your own power. doesn't work. We followers of Jesus need to get them into a real active faith where they're following Jesus rather than just some empty platitude that's out there in society. You don't have to listen very hard to hear a bunch of the junk they're saying about the church. It should be behind closed doors, right? Separation of church and state. Those are, those are both crock. Okay, I'm sorry, but that's what they are. People don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. Empty platitudes. 
I'll tell you a little story that I experienced. We are talking about going out and talking to people. When I was a pastor up in Middlebury, Indiana, which is near South Bend, if you know where that's at, one, uh, we had a bad problem with what they call the lake effect snows, and it snowed like crazy, and a lady called me, and she's in the hospital in South Bend. She said, will you come see me? I said, sure. So I loaded up in my little pickup truck, and I'm driving down the highway, and, you know, about five miles an hour on a freeway, and uh, snowing and blizzarding. And anyway, I went, I went into the church, or the, the hospital, became a church for me. Anyway, I went into the hospital, and I went up, and I saw this lady, very sweet lady, talked to her, held her hand, said a prayer with her, and I got, about that time, they brought a, another lady in and put her into bed next to us. You know, they draw the curtain and all of that, but there's two people to a room there. And I got this overwhelming urge to go say a prayer with this lady. I just, I, I knew I was supposed to, but I was busy with the other one. And then all the doctors came in and all the nurses came in and they were working around her and taking blood pressures and all the stuff that they do, you know. And when they're doing that, you don't interrupt them. Stay out of their way, okay? So I thought, well, I'll just slip out the back and I won't pay, it won't be a problem. So I walked kind of behind him, slipped out the door, and I swear it felt like somebody put their hand out like this and stopped me. And all I could hear was, go pray for her. Okay, now what? Okay, so I turn around. That was about the most dynamic thing that's happened to me, one of them. I turn around, I walk back in, and it was like Moses parted the Red Sea. The nurses and the doctors just stepped away and let me walk right up to her. They never do that, now, by the way. That's not something they do. They did that day. And I went up, and I, I took the lady's hand, and I said, how are you? And she says, not very good. And I said, well, God told me I'm supposed to come pray for you. She got this funny look on her face and said, is that okay with you? She goes, oh, yes. So I prayed for her, and she started crying, tears running down her face, just bawling like a baby. She really was. And I said, it'll be okay. God loves you. And she cried even harder. Finally, she said, I just tried to commit suicide. I didn't think anybody cared. Okay? Now, what if... I hadn't gone and done what God asked me to do. You know what a blessing it was for me just to know I had brought a message from God to somebody? Wow! I'm still kind of running on that. Okay? And this lady, I don't know her name to this day. Don't know it. Don't care. I don't know what it would have meant to her if she'd laid in that bed and nobody come to see her. That's evangelism, guys. I bet you she's in a church somewhere today. Okay? You know, there are a lot of people out there who are going to go to the bad place, a place we call hell. Okay? If we, you and I, don't speak up, the time to be quiet is over. It's time to speak up. Now, how does it feel to think that someone might actually go to hell and eternal torment because you didn't speak up. How does that make you feel? Okay? It breaks my heart. I can't stand the thought of anybody going to hell because I didn't just say something, you know? Makes me a little sick to my stomach. You know, I have, I have uh, children, two daughters, and I have uh, five great-grandchildren who are up bothering me right now. I've got grandkids, too. The great-grandkids are up, tearing my house up right now as we speak having a good time, but I got families and friends and, and work associates and neighbors and all kinds of people that I'm around, and we're all around. The question is, are they following Jesus? Are they in church on Sunday? Do they go to church on Wednesday? It don't matter. It doesn't have to be Sunday. They just have something to do with the church. Where are they? We have to get to work, folks, or hell is going to just keep expanding not going to be a pleasant experience for anybody. You know, when I was 18, <clears throat> well, I got back up a step. When I was 12, I went to school with a little girl named Elma Jean. She was the homeliest little kid you ever saw. But my wife and I were introduced by our teacher. 
I was six foot two, same as I am now, 220 pounds in the sixth grade. I was the biggest person in the building, <laughs> literally, okay? And she was about this tall. I think she's still about that tall. But anyway, they matched us up to square dance because we were the two biggest kids in class. Little did that teacher know what she was doing, okay? About two years later, I moved to another town, and for some unknown reason, I still don't know why, I started writing to my wife, who is now my wife. I wrote to her and just thought, well, she was a nice kid, I'll just, I'll treat her to a letter, you know? But she wrote me back. What a surprise. Well, when I got to be 18, I went to college at Wayne State University in Detroit. Hated every second of it, but I was there. And one day, this stunning young woman with big brown eyes showed up, and she said, Hi, Steve. And I said, Lord, don't let me forget her name. <laughs> you know? And I said, Well, hi, how are you? And I'm going, Now I know who that is. That's Elma Jean. Okay. Well, I got to the point, I started dating her at that point. I got to the point where I just wanted to be with her. Come on, guys, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I wanted to be with her all the time. I couldn't wait to get off work to go see her. She was on my mind all the time, and I, you know, nothing else you know, came before her all of a sudden. I don't know how that happened. I was so in love with that woman, I couldn't do anything. I, I was Twitter-pated, if you remember the movie Bambi, okay? And my dad was getting so frustrated because my grades were going, you know, like that. Everything was going that way. He finally said to me, he says, why don't you knock it off and just marry that girl? And it was like somebody went, wake up, you know? Six months later, we were married. That little light in my head went off, thank goodness. Now, 54 years later, we're still married, having our anniversary this coming Tuesday, I guess. And uh, you know what? She's still a beautiful young lady to me. I, I'm still very much in love with her, and I can't, I just want to be with her. You're, I mean, if you're married, you kind of know what I'm talking about. If your wife goes to visit relatives for a couple of days, I'm looking at the clock. Is she home, due to be home yet? You know, I don't like it when she's gone. I don't like being separated from her. The thought of not being with her is kind of scary for me, okay? I still feel that way. So why do I tell you this story about my wife and I? It's because I love my wife. She'd be embarrassed to death if she was here right now, so I can go ahead and say it, you know. But I tell you that because isn't that how we're supposed to feel about Jesus? Aren't we supposed to be in love with him so much that we really don't want to be away from him? We don't want to be apart from him? We can't wait to get back to him, whatever it is? That's what Jesus is about. The thought should be troubling if you or anybody you know isn't with Jesus, are you troubled for other people too? Those who aren't with Jesus? Now, I'm going to get back to the mandate for here. How do I know God wants me to evangelize? That's what we're talking about here. Evangelizing people. How do I know? So I want to refer you to our, the first scripture. It's in Matthew. And it's 28, 16 through 20. If I can find it. This one ought to sound familiar. It's the very last part of Matthew, at the end of the chapter of the book. Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? There's that big brown-eyed girl coming in the door there. Now I'm down in trouble. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Some high points there. Authority. Make disciples. 
teach, baptize, and he's with us always. Those are pretty good words if you think about it. You know, Jesus has the authority. In other words, he's got the right to. He's supposed to tell us something. He can pass this on to us. And he's got that authority, and this is what he's telling you to do. <clears throat> he said, go. Now, you notice he didn't say, stay inside your building. It doesn't belong in public. He didn't say any of that. He said, go. That means everywhere, anywhere, somewhere. Okay? And he said, make disciples. Now, you notice he didn't say make believers, because you can't make a believer. God does that. Jesus does that. The only thing I can do is point you to the one that you need to, to know. I can point you to Jesus, but I'm not saving you. He's doing it. Does that make any sense? But what I can do and you can do is make a disciple. You say, well, what's a disciple? A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus, who wants to be like Jesus. Now, first you've got to believe, Right? Then you work on becoming a disciple. That's where the church comes in. I don't know how you become a disciple on your own. Maybe you can. I just don't know how. Believe me, I looked. I just can't figure that out. The only place I can show that tries to make disciples is the church. I'm not talking about any particular. I'm talking about the church in general. Okay? And then it says, baptize. We're supposed to baptize. You can argue about how that is. All I know is you get your head wet. Okay? And then teach them. Teach them, yes. You got to teach them what's in this book. How are you going to know what God's word is if you never heard about it? I got two little great grandkids coming. They were just tickled to death last night because I told them how to say a prayer when they go to bed. Okay? And they pray every night, but I taught them a different one, you know. But that's how you get the things across to people. And then the last one is, Jesus will be with us. You don't have to be afraid to go tell somebody about Jesus. You don't have to because he's going with you. They're not going to hurt you. If they laugh at you, that's on them. That's not on you. Keep going. Does that sound a little bit like some instructions to you? Sounds like it to me. You know, the funny thing I noticed is, do you remember when Peter was on the top of the the house, and then he went out to the, uh, the, the Roman centurion's house, and all those people were baptized and, and became Christians. There was something that was present there. First of all, there was the word, right? They had to, had, had to hear something. Second is, they were baptized. And third, there had to be somebody there to tell them the word and to do the baptizing. That's where you come in. Now, you may not personally do the baptizing, but you can be there with them when they get baptized. That's a reward. The same thing happened when the uh, the uh, rich man or the servant from, I want to say Ethiopia, was at the thing, and he stopped on his chariot on the way back, and Thomas went up and got in the chariot with him and told him what he was reading. He didn't understand what he was reading. Thomas had to explain it to him. And the guy said, well, is there any reason I can't be baptized? Right there's some water, and they baptized him right there. And then take Paul. There was Paul. Paul's on the road to Damascus or wherever he's going, and he's struck blind. And what's the word? Jesus said, Paul, or Saul at that point, why are you persecuting me? Now you're going to be blind. Go on to a town, and I'll send somebody to you. And then he calls a guy, and for love of me, I can't remember his name now. But anyway, he calls this, this guy and says, go down to this guy who's blind, Paul, and lift this curse from him. He goes down, the blindness comes out, he's okay, and he's baptized and converted. And he becomes the strongest disciple in history. Three parts again. The word, a person, and baptism. Okay? That's called the Great Commission. Okay, that's what this particular text is called. And it's when Jesus gave you and I His ministry. He turned it over to you. If you're going to be one of his followers, our mission is to get to the lost, those who have not yet been saved or think they're saved but aren't. Okay? 
Sounds a lot like instructions of what we are to do, don't you think? Let's go to 1 Corinthians, be the next one. And this is 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And short but sweet. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now you're not the body of Christ by yourself. But when we come together individually, we become the body of Christ. Does that make any sense? You want the power that the good Lord's going to give out? That's where you get it, coming together. Okay? We, today, are part of the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ because we've come together. We might be from different churches or congregations, but we're all part of the body of the Christ today. Jesus is speaking to his church when he says that. So when we come together like today, we make up the body of Christ, his church. Maybe there's some more instructions here that we uh, are to bring people into the church, you think? That sound like it might be this? Go to first, the second one, uh, another scripture is 1 Corinthians <coughs> 9 through 26. <coughs> 9 26. This is Paul speaking. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. What's he talking about there? You know? Paul's saying that if he runs in a race, or if you fight, you got to know where you're going. If you're going to run a race, you gotta, you got to follow the track, right? If you're going to fight, you don't just sit there and whoop at the air. That's not a fight. You ever notice boxers do shadow boxing? But they're boxing with a shadow, and they're practicing. So that when they stand up against a real person, they know what to do. That's what we have to do too. He says, I don't flail around. He is certain what he is supposed to do. Are you certain what you're supposed to do as a Christian? Certain to where you know what you're supposed to do when the opportunity presents itself. The next one is in James. And that's chapter 4, 14. This is an interesting one too. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is life? What is your life? It is even, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Now why is that important? Because you haven't got tomorrow. You got right now. There's no guarantee that tomorrow will get here. It'll get here for somebody. But it might not be you or me. I don't know. This is an important one. We are told that we do not know. You know, I can make all the best plans in the world, but I still don't know what tomorrow is going to bring or what will happen tomorrow. Our life is short. You know, yesterday I was 18 years old and married my wife. Now I'm 73 years old and we've been married for 54 years. That seems like just that fast to me. And I've enjoyed it, most of it, except for when she's mad at me, you know? But here today, gone tomorrow is the point. <clears throat> In other words, there's no time to waste. We don't have that much time. Do what you're supposed to do now. Now. Your soul and that of someone else may very well depend on it. I'm going to go back to the book of Matthew. It's 13, chapter, verses 42 through 43. Matthew 13, 42 through 43. And this is Jesus speaking. And will cast them into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now that ought to be a scary passage. You know? We are told that the lawless and the offensive will be cast into a furnace or a fire. 
where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It will be a sad, sad day. I don't know, gnashing of teeth means you're in pain and anguish. Okay? Sounds like Jesus is talking about hell, doesn't it? Nobody likes to hear about that. You know, we, we modern thinkers, <clears throat> we're modern people, we're educated and scientific-minded, follow the science, right? Well, not in this case, okay? We don't want to think about hell. Most people believe there's a heaven, they believe they're going there, but they don't want to think about hell. Many just don't believe in hell at all. But if you believe in what Jesus says, he just talked about it. If you're a follower of Jesus, what do you do with that? If you are a follower, then you have to understand that eternity in hell is what Jesus came to save us from. That's what he came. Why don't we want to tell people what Jesus is saving them from? We want to save them from addiction. We want to save them from sinning. We want to save them. That's not what we're trying to save them from. What we're trying to save them from is where that'll get them. A toasty place, you know, where it's not very comfortable. We just don't like to say that. Well, now you know what God has said for the followers. And that's just some of the passages. I encourage you to pick your Bible up and go look for yourself. There are many more passages, many, many passages. These are just a few, okay? But what do we get from these, these few scriptures here? I want to just kind of summarize here. This is what is said the followers of Jesus are to do. One, make disciples and teach them. Two, Jesus formed his church and told us to come together. Three, you know what you're supposed to do now. Do it. Four, you don't know what tomorrow brings, so do it now. Five, because those outside the body of Christ offend and will be burned in hell. Now, I ask you again, who's responsible for evangelism in your church? You are, each and every one of you. Let's get going. What would this world be like if everybody in this room started to evangelize? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Steve, for that encouraging word. For those of you who uh, want to see that brown-eyed young lady that married him, she's right back here. This is Jean Ellis. <laughs> you didn't know I was going to embarrass you, did you? Yeah, I, know, I do it to everybody in our church at least once, don't I? <laughs> anyway, like I said earlier, behind every great man is a greater woman. And I'm sure Thea would agree as well. Right? I've seen a picture of you and your wife, I believe, on the day of your wedding. Yeah, she was dressed in a white shirt, and you both, not white shirt, white dress, and both of you had smiles on so big you could have beat the Cheshire cat with it. <laughs> so, before I ask Theo to come up this, mor this morning, I want to share with you a story. Many of the people that attend my church will know this story. Some 15 years ago, I know of an individual, <clears throat> an individual that spent 21 months in federal prison for uh, mail fraud and conspiracy to launder money. That person, when he went into prison, he decided, not going to watch TV, I'm going to read books, especially the Bible, and, I'm gonna, and he was going to start a Bible study. During those 21 months, he had the privilege of witnessing to over 250 inmates and leading 12 of them, you might recognize that number, 12, right? <coughs> to become believers in Jesus Christ. That person kept up with some of those folks. Today, two of them are pastors in churches. Okay? So that person had the privilege of planting seeds, watering the harvest, watering the seeds, and a few harvests. That person was me. 
I spent 21 months in prison. And during that time, I read, didn't watch TV. We had a movie once a week. I'd watch the movie. But I spent my time reading the Bible, reading other books, 352 books total in 21 months, and leading a Bible study. Other than marrying my wife and becoming a believer in Jesus Christ, that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I had the opportunity to look at myself and understand that I was a sinner. Even though I'd already become a believer in Jesus Christ, I was still a sinner. And I fell short of the glory of God. Changed my ways. Okay. So, I'm not here to brag on me, but to share with you, each and every one of us are called to be fishers of men. Jesus, when he rounded up his disciples, said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. One of those men was Matthew. He was a tax collector. Tax collectors in those days probably were hated more than the IRS. Many of them were also uh, thieves. So, if Jesus can take a tax collector or a criminal such as myself and turn them into fishers of men, he can do the same thing for each and every one of you. Okay? So, without further ado, I'd like you to meet Theo Griffin. Theo and I met for the first time at one of the pastor's meetings, and there's only two people that I know of that have a smile like yours. <laughs> you and Paul Scott, one of the wow. members of our church. Awesome. So, Paul awesome. leads us in a song from time to time with his yes. guitar, and he always has this huge smile on and you do too. Thank you. So Rich. thanks for being with us. Well, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Good. Yes. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to want to thank uh, Rich for the vision that God has given to him to bring the community together and to bring pastors together around an issue and a topic that is so significant to the church. I'm not sure how the church actually became like this, but if you look at the church today, you'd recognize that we are more interested in worship and things that cater to our fellowship than we are in matters, two of the most important things, I think, in the church, which are prayer and evangelism. I don't know how we became like that, but that is a sad travesty that our church finds itself in, that matters concerning prayer and reaching lost people are not significant to us. So I'm Theo, and um, as Rich mentioned, I'm married to the beautiful Randy Griffin. We met uh, on the Caribbean island of St. Thomas in 1990, became married the same year, and we have two children and a grandson. I'm the youngest of 11 children. Um, my dad died when I was five years old. My mom never remarried. But one of the things that she instilled in us, particularly in the younger ones, because there's a 22-year difference between, 22, I'm sorry, there's a 22-year age difference between myself and my oldest sibling. Uh, and so one of the things that she instilled in the younger ones was that we went to church every Sunday. But the year was 1982. I was just about getting ready to turn 18. I was on the verge of rebelling against everything that my mother had taught us. And it was a Sunday afternoon. I was in, the, in my backyard, and I had, this, I had this strong sense that I needed to go to church that evening. There was an evangelistic service happening at our church. In fact, there was a week of evangelistic services. And I had ceased going to church um, in the evenings. I was only sporadically attending uh, on Sunday mornings. But I had the strong sense that I needed to be in church that, that evening. And what was even weird, or more weird than that, was that I had the strong sense that I would become a Christian that evening. 
Um, so I went ahead and I, I invited one of my school friends, uh, his name is Euclid, I invited him to come to church with me that evening, and Euclid said, no, I don't want to go, I want to go to the movies, and I said, no, let's go to church that evening. He finally relented and came. We both sat at the very back of the church, in the very last pew. I don't remember anything else that the preacher was preaching that Sunday except this, the verse that he was using. For this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide even until death. That was from Psalm 48 and verse 12, I think. Bef even before he was done preaching, I got up, I walked all the way to the front of the church, I knelt at the altar, and I said, Lord, I need you in my life, would you come in, set me free, save me, become my savior, something like that. I wasn't there for 30 seconds when I felt somebody kneeling beside me as well. That very person was the guy that I invited to church. We both gave our lives to Christ that same evening, and we both are ministers of the gospel today. Amen, indeed. I want to begin my uh, presentation this morning by asking you two questions. They're very important questions. Is there anybody here this morning who got saved as a result of somebody sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you? Yes, I see hands. I see hands. Very good. Second question is this. Have you ever told anybody about Jesus who ended up giving their lives to Christ? Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, let me share with you a quote from John Wesley. Now, he was speaking to a group of pastors, uh, but certainly what he said was not limited to just pastors. I, I feel it there um, for every person who is a follower of Christ. John Wesley said to them this. You have nothing to do but save souls. Let that sink in for a little bit. You have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. And go always, not only to those who want you, but to those who want you most. To save as many souls as you can, to bring as many sinners as possible to repentance to build them up in that holiness without which they cannot see the Lord. Now, the topic this morning is, Lord, make me a fisher of men. As you look at that topic, you recognize that it is a prayer. It is a prayer. It is you asking God to make you somebody who can go out and fish for men. That's a metaphor for saving souls. I want us to look very quickly at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, because in that verse there is both a command and a promise from Jesus, a promise, a command that he gave his disciples and a promise that attended that, that uh, command as well. So Mark 4 and verse 18 and to verse 20, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, meaning Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. So the command there is for us to follow Jesus. And what Jesus promises to do when we are following him is that he will make us fishers of men. So, it begs the question then, or it is very logical that if you are following Jesus, he will make you to be a fisher of men. I would beg to suggest this morning that if we are not fishers of men, then we are not really following Jesus. All right? The second verse I want to introduce you to is followed, I'm sorry, is related to the first. It is in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. And those of us who live here in Greenfield will be very familiar with this particular verse because we all, we recognize that we live in a farming community. We see the cornfields every um, spring and we see the rush to harvest the corn in the summer and in the fall. Jesus says to his, his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. So that's a description that he makes. And then he says, secondly, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, laborers I'm sorry, into his harvest. 
I am told that in Greenfield alone, there are 40,000 people who are unchurched. Uh, um, uh, Steve Ellis did a wonderful job of telling us that if every church in Greenfield had three services, there would still be um, half of Greenfield that um, is not in it. The harvest is plentiful. I don't need to tell you that. You see it. You see the urgency of it. You see the many people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. You see the homes that are being destroyed. You see the number of people who are going to prisons. You read the papers. You see the misery that is in, in Greenfield. I don't need to tell you that there is an urgency to the harvest fields. And Jesus says that our response to all of that is that we need to be praying. I don't know about your churches, but I know that my prayer meetings are the least attended service of any service that we have. And that bothers me. It bothers me that in a church of 150, we have less than 10 people that show up to pray. So if we are not praying, if Jesus says to us, it, all right, let me, let me back up a little bit. If Jesus, who is the Lord of the harvest, says to us that we should be praying that he will send laborers into the harvest fields, then who tells us that we can do things other than what he asks us to do? So I don't know why our churches aren't excited about prayer, because how else do we expect the harvest, fe the harvest fields to be harvested unless we are, in fact, engaged in that? So I want to share with us, first of all, this point, that Jesus has called all of us to be co-laborers. None of us gets a free pass. None of us gets to say, well, that's the pastor's job, to reach the lost. None of us gets to say, well, it is only those people who are good at evangelism that should be doing it. No, Jesus has called us all. In fact, he called his disciples and he sent them out two by two, which is very significant because you sometimes need a partner in ministry. You need somebody to help you pray. You need somebody to share the burden of what it takes to win the loss. We are all co-laborers. Now, somebody, I think, along the, way, along the line, somebody fooled us into thinking that um, we hire a pastor and we pay him a good salary, I laugh at that, but we pay him a good salary and his job is to make sure that the church is full every Sunday morning and it is his job to make sure that people get saved. That couldn't be further from the truth. Our job is to equip you so that you go out and win the loss. That is our job. I'm told that uh, shepherds don't produce sheep, sheep produce sheep. All right, so we train you and equip you in terms of how to go out and win. But we're all co-laborers. Here is the mistake that I think we make secondly, is that we easily forget how urgent the harvest fields are. We, we easily forget that. And so as I mentioned earlier, every spring we see the tractors go out and they plow the fields and then we see corns everywhere, corn fields everywhere. And then, in the fall, we see the urgency and the rush of these combines to go out and harvest and to make sure they get all the crop in before uh, the rainy season and before the frost and the cold sets in. We all are familiar with how urgent that practice is. However, we don't seem to get the picture of how urgent it is to reap the harvest fields of souls for God's kingdom. I want to suggest to us this morning that if, if this is something that is near and dear to God's heart, then it, it should also be near and dear to our hearts as well. Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So you have a description there of the dilemma that Jesus finds himself in. There are people who are broken, lost, in prison, hopeless, wanting to be rescued, but the people to do that are so few. Here's the third point I want to say real quickly. Nothing short of our earnest prayer will save souls. Now that might be a shock to some of you, but that is the absolute truth. Jesus says, therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into the field. 
He didn't necessarily say go to a seminar, that's good. He didn't say develop all of your techniques in winning lost people, that is good. He said pray. And not just pray, notice, notice the description, pray earnestly. That means fervently. That means continuously. Invest yourselves in praying that God will raise up laborers whom he will send into the harvest fields. And here's something else that you must note as well. That when you are praying that God would raise up laborers, be open to the real possibility that God might send you. Okay? So it's not, that, it's not just that you're praying that God would send laborers out, but you need to be aware that Jesus may very well call you to go out as a laborer to save souls. Here's the final thing I want to say to you as I close this morning. That the difficulty of the mission should not be a deterrent. Sometimes because we think that, hey, it's, it's kind of risky. And it was risky because Jesus said, I was sending you out as lambs among wolves. It's a very risky thing. Um, you're going to face rejection, opposition. People are going to curse you out until you get out of their face. They don't want to hear what you have to offer them. That's very risky. But that, that need not deter you anyway. Jesus says, go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, the last time I checked, wolves kind of like to feast on lambs. For breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's risky. It's risky. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go. Here's a song that whenever I hear this song, it's a song that emerged somewhere in the 80s, I think. In fact, the, the author of it is now dead, John Stearns. But uh, let me just take a moment to read the lyrics of this song, and then I'll wrap up. He says this, As we look all around us, we see all the fields are white. They ripened unto harvest, yet so quickly comes the night. Christians, you must get busy. Oh, there is so much work to do. Here's an urgent task awaiting you. Souls are crying. Men are dying. Won't you lead them to the cross? Go and find them. Oh, please help to win them. Win the lost at any cost. Check your folds, my Christian brothers, and see if all your children are in. Are there some strayed, lost in blackened fields of sin? You must go out and reach them. Go quickly without delay. Soon the trump of God will sound, I'm sorry, will close the day. Souls are crying. Men are dying. Won't you lead them to the cross? Go and find them. Oh, please help to win them. Win the lost at any cost. Let us take a moment to pray. God, this is a matter that is near and dear to your heart. And yet, to our shame, we confess that we treat it so lightly. We are contented to know that we are saved and on, on our way to heaven, and we often forget that all around us, in our very homes, in our neighborhoods, at our workplaces, there are people who are lost and dying and on their way to hell. God, I ask that as a result of our being here this morning, that you would stir something in each of our hearts, that you'd help us to become aware of a need to invest ourselves in the most important activity that there is, which is to win people to Jesus Christ. Continue to bless the remainder of this seminar today, and God, as a result of it, we pray, as was said earlier, that a revival will come to Hancock County and the surrounding areas, that even the few of us who are here will become so impassioned and excited about the faith and about winning the loss, that we will see a great harvest being reaped for the kingdom of heaven. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you, Theo.
So Thea was very gracious to come and join us today on short notice. We had somebody else scheduled to do this part, and he was unable to do so uh, because he's on mandatory uh, work uh, through the union that he works for in a project in Ball State. So Thea, was it Monday or Tuesday that I dropped by? Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. So Tuesday of this week, I asked Theo if he'd fill in. He was gracious enough, enough to do that and did a marvelous job. Thank you. So while you were speaking, Theo, I had this thought. Let's assume for a minute that all of Hancock County is divided up into equal land for every single man, woman, and child in the county. Now let's also assume that the only people that plant those fields, take care of those fields, and harvest those fields are people within this county that go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. You know we'd all starve. It'd be like trying to feed the entire county with the food that's right over there. It would be a very difficult task for it to survive. Yet we don't do what we're called to do, many of us. So we're going to take a break now. And I have two assignments for you during the break. One is meet and talk to at least two people you've never met before. And the second is eat at least five or six donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding on the donuts, but we're going to have plenty of donuts. You're welcome to take some home with you when we conclude. So we're going to take a 15-minute break. So if you would, mingle, see each other. The restrooms are out this way and to the left if you need them. Of course, you can see the food over here. So thank you all for coming. Let's 